Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, we have a busy week ahead of us. It's a lot of earnings reports for different companies that I hold. Lots of big players. I mean, like the biggest companies in the world, like Apple and Microsoft, are reporting their earnings, which is a way of saying they're going to let us all know publicly how they're doing as a company, if they're growing, if they're meeting their expectations, or if they're falling short. And this kind of gives a direction of the overall market and where we're headed. So I'll give my thoughts on earnings, but I also want to do a little bit of education in this episode. Focus on some fundamentals here. I want to go over what I consider to be quality when looking at an investment. So there's different things you can look at. You can look at value. You can look at growth. I'm going to go over quality in this episode and why I put such an emphasis on quality with companies. I'm also going to be responding to a video put out by another YouTuber. The channel's called The Plain Bagel, and he put out a video called Why I Don't Reveal My Portfolio. His name's Richard. He's a CFA, as well as he just moved in to be a portfolio manager, and he explains in this video why he doesn't reveal his portfolio, and he gives a healthy criticism for YouTubers that share their stock picks, as well as they share their portfolio. So he's criticizing YouTubers that do that to some degree. As a YouTuber, that unapologetically share stock picks all the time, companies that I'm buying and companies that I'm selling, as well as I transparently share my portfolio week to week, I thought it would be good to give a response to this video and kind of give my reaction to it. So I'm going to be going through point by point and looking at what he said and giving my kind of side of this as someone that does share their stock picks. So I'll be responding to Richard and the plain bagel. And then also, I got an email from a longtime viewer and fan of the show that says that he invested $237 into Dogecoin last year, and so far it's worth roughly $30,000. So a $237 investment turned into $30,000, and now he's asking me, Joseph, what would you do in this situation? Would you keep it invested? Would you sell out of it? You know, what are your thoughts on this? I'm going to be giving him a response and what I would do in this episode. Now, before jumping into all of that, of course, I have to give a shout out to the growing number of Patreons. We've seen a huge amount of people join over just the past week or so. So I appreciate you guys for supporting the channel. If you're interested in that type of thing and you're in a situation to be able to support the channel, you also get a lot of benefits, a private Discord server, a whole dividend tracking, portfolio tracking spreadsheet and website, as well as some other fun things like exclusive content, little clubhouses on Discord and different things like that. So if you want to try it out, it's a lot of fun. There's a link in the description if you're interested, or it's patreon.com slash Joseph Carlson. Now let's go ahead and jump right in. This is my passive income portfolio on M1 Finance. If you want to see the progress of this over time, if I gain money, if I lose money, what I'm buying, what I'm selling, everything with this portfolio, you can follow along for free. Just make sure you subscribe to the channel. This week, we have a lot of companies reporting earnings. In fact, we have... I mean, a ton of companies. This is like the biggest earnings week of any week of the year. We have companies like Tesla that have reported earnings. We have 3M, AMD, Microsoft, Visa, Alphabet, Pinterest, Starbucks, General Electric. And that's just on Tuesday. That's just one day. Going throughout this week, we have dozens and dozens of huge companies that report earnings. It's a big portion of the S&P 500. So we'll get a lot of clarity of how these companies are really performing now, having said that, what I'd like to say about earnings is that I think that for the most part, responses to earnings in companies is overblown. Sometimes companies have poor quarterly earnings. They don't do good one quarter. And investors overreact if that's the case. That's almost always what I see. Investors overreact with earnings. If Apple doesn't have a great quarter and it's a little bit lower than investors' expectations, that's not the end of Apple. The same thing with Microsoft. The same thing can be said for most of these companies. Companies like Disney or Costco or Home Depot or Nike, these are all high quality consumer companies that one quarter of earnings is not gonna determine the company's future. Every one of these companies has had quarters where they had poor earnings and investors sold out of them because investors are short-term thinking. Investors don't look at the long-term picture. So I'm not gonna be looking at one quarter and deciding whether or not to sell a company. If it drops down enough and I think the company still has a good future, I might buy more of it. But I certainly am not going to make huge decisions off of just some quarterly reports coming up. I think that that's irresponsible to do. And Warren Buffett has talked continually against that short-term focus. Now, one thing that I do focus on more than earnings, more than one quarterly report is quality business quality. I look at the holdings and the companies that I'm invested in, and I try to assess the quality of the company that I'm investing in. Now, the question that you might be asking is, what does that mean? 
What is quality of a company or an investment? That's what I wanna go over here. I broke it down into four different things and these certainly aren't exhaustive. So there's other things that you can also add to quality of an investment outside of these four different aspects. But I think these are four fundamentals of a high quality company. The first one I would say is that it has a high return on invested capital. What does it mean when a company has a high return on invested capital? You see that abbreviated as ROIC sometimes. Well, what that means is that the company can take money from investors or they can take it from the debt markets and they can use that money to make more money. That's all it means. The companies that can use that money to make the most money are the highest quality because they're the best capital allocators. They have ways of spending your money to give you better returns than anywhere else you could put that money. That is a high return on invested capital. So let's go through a company that does meet this characteristic, a company that does have a high ROIC. Microsoft is a company that has a high return on invested capital. There's a few ways that you can look at this. The first is that they're growing in every segment of business they have. They have it broken into three different segments productivity and business software. This part right here, just the blue, is like their legacy products, right? The Microsoft Word, the Microsoft Excel, the stuff that you've known for over 10 years. This is the stuff that they had that's legacy products. And even this is still growing. They're still growing their legacy product suite. But on top of that, you add in intelligence cloud, things like Microsoft Azure. This is growing as well. And then you add in personal computing. This is growing as well. And you look at it quarter over quarter and Microsoft has been able to grow all three forms of their revenue continuously. This company in every facet is growing. And we can also look at the margins of the company. Microsoft has enormous margins with their products. They have over 40% operating margins in the last quarter. That means that they're making a lot of money with the money that they have. They're a very profitable company. So Microsoft for sure meets the qualifications of high returns on invested capital. They have that above most other firms in existence. Now let's go ahead and compare this, a high quality company, to a low quality company. We have Nikola. Nikola is a low quality company. This hydrogen vehicle company initially had a huge surge in stock price as it was piggybacking off of the enthusiasm and success of Tesla. But once deceptive marketing advertising campaigns were exposed, the company saw a precipitous decline in stock price and continues to go down right up until just about a week ago when it's had a small bump back up. But overall, this company is a very low quality company. We can determine that by looking at its characteristics. Does Nikola have a high return on invested capital? No, this company doesn't have any return on invested capital. In fact, every single quarter, this company takes investors' money and burns it. It just gets rid of it. It spends it in different ways without gaining any revenue. In Q4 of 2020, it went through $147 million. In Q3, it went through $117 million. In Q2, it went through $86 million. In Q1, it went through $33 million, and so on and so forth. Every single quarter, even annually, it's lost hundreds of millions of dollars over time. And it has yet to post any meaningful revenue whatsoever. And Nikola currently has no operating margins because they make no revenue. So we can't look at the operating margins of the company because it doesn't exist. So on step one, on number one, we have high returns on invested capital. Companies like Microsoft have extremely high returns on invested capital. Other companies like Nikola don't have any returns on their invested capital. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Capital goes there, it's lit on fire, and it's gone forever. The companies you want to invest in are ones that are going to take a dollar of yours and turn it into $2. Not the ones that are going to take a dollar of yours and turn it into 50 cents. In number two, we look at Moat. Does the company have a dominant position in the market? Is it able to fend off competitors? That's a big question when you're looking at a quality investment. If a company doesn't have a moat, it's not gonna be able to keep the high returns on invested capital for very long. Over time, those returns on its invested capital will get degraded more and more as other competitors eat away at their profit margins. The way that you can determine a moat is similar to determining the high returns on invested capital. You look at the operating margins of the company. If the company can continue to keep high operating margins over long periods of time, that means they have a moat. That means it's very difficult for competitors to eat away at their market share and eat away at their business. Companies like Microsoft have a long-standing competitive moat, which is a characteristic about this company that makes it difficult for competitors to compete with. Companies like Nikola that operate in a highly competitive field of renewable vehicles or hydrogen or electric vehicles, that's a big area to compete in. 
There's companies like Tesla that have the lead. They have a moat because it's already difficult to catch up to them. And there's a lot of different competitors trying to gain market share in this growing industry. Nikola so far has nothing to suggest in their numbers or through qualitative research that they have any significant moat, which means competitors can easily take market share from their business, which is what they're doing right now. Now, outside of number one, the high returns on invested capital, and number two, the moat, having a dominant position in the market that they're able to maintain, we have number three, great leadership. And this is something I think that investors need to look more at. Leadership is extremely important in a company. The CEO is the one that's determining which direction the company takes. And for great leadership, we can look again at Microsoft. Satya Nadella is ranked as the best CEO in US by some polls. He's an incredibly good CEO that has led the company in a future-driven direction, switching everything from their legacy type of business to a new cloud business. And while doing that, he's kept away from controversy. He's kept away from government regulations, big tech problems, all these type of issues you're seeing with the other tech companies. Satya Nadella has somehow avoided that entirely. So not only has he grown the earnings and the prospects of the company and driven it in a good direction overall, but he's done it without controversy. So Satya Nadella is the example of a high quality leader. He's taking the company in a good direction and avoiding controversy in doing so. We can again look at the example of Nikola is a company that suffers from low quality leadership. Trevor Milton was the founder and the CEO of Nikola, and his whole reputation has been mired by a bunch of scandals, including fraud allegations. Hindenburg Research exposed things like their bogus promotional video, where they rolled a truck down the hill and tried to pass it off as though it was driving itself. That's not something that good leaders with good conduct would be willing to do. He's also been part of federal investigations. He's resigned in disgrace from Nikola, and he's had sexual misconduct allegations allegations. This is what you want to avoid in leadership. All these controversies, all these issues, the big black eye that this has left on the corporation, even though they now have new leadership and a new CEO, the reputation still follows the company and it will take some time for them to repair that. They'll really have to turn around and show that they're now being a completely transparent and honest company and they're headed in a better direction. But the reputation from the leadership is extremely important and the decisions the CEO makes has a huge impact on the share price, as you can see. Now, after leadership, we have strong balance sheet. That's another thing that quality companies have is they have a balance sheet that puts them in a good position for future growth, not one that is a long-term drag on the performance of the company. And of course, Microsoft is one of the companies that has the best balance sheet in the world. In fact, Microsoft has such a good credit rating by Standard & Poor's that it's a better credit rating than the US government. It's triple A rated, which only two companies in the world have that, Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson. They also have $132 billion in cash and only $50 billion in debt. So this is a company with plenty of liquidity, an enormous amount of income, high margins, and a fantastic balance sheet overall. Now, of course, startup companies like Nikola don't have anywhere strong of balance sheets. They're burning through money and they have limited time to generate revenue and profits before having to go back to the debt markets or to investors to raise more capital. So small companies and startup companies typically have worse balance sheets, but even some big companies like AT&T struggle with their balance sheet and it's always a concern for them. Those aren't as high quality of investments like companies like Microsoft and Apple that have extremely strong balance sheets. These companies have minimal debt, they have an enormous amount of cash and they have a huge amount of free cash flow they're in an extremely good position so overall these are some of the basic fundamentals i look for when i'm making investments and leaning my portfolio towards quality when i say quality i mean high returns on invested capital having a significant moat great leadership and a strong balance sheet and i try to invest in companies that meet these characteristics more often than not i invest in companies like apple JP Morgan, Disney. I'm recently buying a lot of Microsoft. I think that Costco is a high quality company, Home Depot, MasterCard, and Visa. These are all ones in my portfolio that I'm trying to build up bigger and bigger holdings in because I think they have characteristics. They'll make them so that they're competitive long into the future. And while doing that, I continue to grow my passive income. In the past 30 days, I've earned $778 in dividends. So it is growing pretty steadily over time as I continue to dollar cost average into these great companies. Now, moving on, I want to respond to this video by Richard from the Plain Bagel YouTube channel. Um, he's a CFA, so he's a certified financial analyst, and he's moving into the role of a portfolio manager. So he's going to be managing people's portfolios professionally, and he came out with a video 
titled Why I Don't Reveal My Portfolio and My Thoughts on YouTubers Sharing Stock Picks. Now, he shares, I think, some thoughtful criticism of YouTubers like me that share their stock picks in their portfolio week by week. Now, let me first say, before I respond to this, that I don't have any type of beef with Richard. I actually like his channel. I like him. I think that he's better than most financial YouTube channels out there. And for the most part, I think the advice he shares is very similar to what I do on my channel. Most of it is is conservative investment advice that leads to long-term wealth creation, that type of thing. So I want to respond to this and give a different viewpoint on it and kind of respond point by point on some of the things that he brings up. So let's go ahead and jump in. He first brings up different big YouTubers that share their portfolios. I know there are some YouTubers who focus on investment picks and things like that. Uh, you know, financial education is one of the bigger ones that comes to mind. And on the personal finance, you know, just finance channels in general, it's something that, you know, Graham Stephan has revealed his trades of certain positions. And Meet Kevin is a big YouTuber who has, you know, revealed his entire investment portfolio. So he brings up, there's now a number of YouTubers sharing their portfolios and investment picks. One thing I wanna say is this is something that I've done since the very beginning over two years ago. If you look back on my channel, every single video, every single one from the very beginning, the very first episode has a thumbnail with my portfolio value on it. And then if you watch the video, I show my entire portfolio, my allocation, I explain what stocks I'm buying and selling and everything that I'm doing and the reasons I'm doing it. I offer complete transparency with my investments, complete transparency with my finances. Back two years ago when I started, that was something very unique. Not a lot of people had this level of transparency with their investments in 2019 early on. I was part of a few individuals doing this, which is now turned into a very popular thing to do. But Richard goes on to outline some of the reasons that he doesn't share his portfolio and his criticisms for those that do. But I do have my chartered financial analyst designation. I do work as an investment analyst for a wealth manager. So, you know, that is something I do as a job. I, I work as someone who researches stocks, makes recommendations, and those recommendations are used by our clients. So Richard had worked as a CFA, and now he's a registered portfolio manager, which means that he manages other people's wealth directly and helps them directly make investment decisions. That's something that he does as his career. So let's go through one by one and see his concerns of people sharing their portfolios. First and foremost is the fact that, quite frankly, um, a lot of the ideas I hold aren't my own. <laughs> That's just a matter of fact. Um, I work in my capacity as an investment analyst in a team of portfolio managers. All right, so the first reason does make sense. He works with a team of investment managers, and if he were to take their work and their advice and their research on companies and then broadcast it on his own YouTube channel, it kind of feel like he might be taking other people's work and then profiting from it. Not something that Richard probably wants to do. So that makes sense with him working as a portfolio manager, not wanting to share his investment picks. Now I get lots of ideas from different people, a lot of different research from my discord, from different people I talk to on a regular basis, but I don't get ideas from a team I work with professionally. So my ideas for the most part are my conclusions on stocks I wanna buy with other people's inputs. So that might be a little bit of a different situation there. But let's go ahead and see what his reason number two is. The second reason is more of a selfish reason. And that's that I, I truly believe that posting ideas and stock positions online can influence your own investment process in a negative way. What I mean by that is when you post an idea, like let's say I make a recommendation for a given stock, um, you're sort of marrying that idea. You're making a public stance about a given position. And that makes it very hard to pivot in the future if something around your thesis changes. I think this is another valid concern. If you're a YouTuber and you make some big, bold predictions about a stock, and then your investment thesis changes on that stock, it can be kind of embarrassing to come out and say, hey guys, I think I was wrong. You know, I didn't get all this uh, information. My, my bold thesis was flawed on it. And now I'm changing my mind on this stock. It takes some humility as a content creator to admit fault and that you've been wrong with certain investments and being able to openly discuss it and change your mind on certain stocks. And Richard even goes on to highlight how much more difficult this is when you made the entire brand of your YouTube channel based around certain companies. Think of like Arc Research or all these YouTube channels that are focused entirely on Tesla. Um, you know, hopefully Tesla does well, but if something changed with Tesla, think about how difficult it would be for those channels 
and that you know investment fund to pivot, to change their mind. I think this is a very valid point that Richard brings up. There's content creators and YouTube channels centered specifically around one company like Tesla, and they make a lot of content centered around that company. Well, they have extra incentive to keep talking about that company because that's what their audience wants to listen to. So even if they have changed their investment thesis on it, it's going to be very difficult for them to want to change the direction of their content. Now, personally, I don't feel like I have a problem with this. I invest in a variety of different companies in different sectors. I buy in and sell out of companies all the time. I'm not married into any of these companies. I'm willing to sell out of any of them anytime I think that they're going to be a poor investment. And I have done so. I'm not married to uh, Microsoft or Apple or Costco or AT&T. If any of these companies were ones that I no longer wanted to have in my portfolio, or if I come to the conclusion that I've been wrong on a company, I'll openly admit it and explain why I've changed my mind. I just don't want to put myself in a position where I'm entrenched in a position and, and I feel like I have to stick with something. Now, personally, again, I haven't ever felt like I'm entrenched into one particular investment. I invest in whatever companies I want and I sell out of whatever companies I want and I explain why. Now, one thing I want to bring up on this point of sharing your stock picks and feeling entrenched in those positions. While I don't feel entrenched in those positions, I think there is a positive effect of having the accountability of sharing your investments publicly. Because what it does is hold your investments to a higher standard. If I know that my investments are going to be shared publicly, and people are going to see how my investments turn out week by week, that gives me significant incentive to further research my companies and make sure I'm using prudent investment techniques, that I'm investing in quality companies with good fundamentals, with good futures. In fact, I would say because of this YouTube channel and because I know that my investments are gonna be broadcasted publicly, I do probably 10 times the research that I would otherwise do on my investments. I look into them further. I get more feedback from a variety of different people that I respect their input. I look at their fundamentals. I look at their balance sheet. I look at the qualities of the business. I do a tremendous amount of research beforehand because I know that it's going to be shared publicly. So I think there's two sides to this coin. While sharing your investments publicly could lead to poor performance because you feel married to investments and you don't want to sell out of them because you've created content centered around it, but I think it can also lead to better performance because you have more accountability on your decisions. They're more public, they're more broadcasted, and that incentivizes you to do better research to come up with better investments. Now let's go ahead and hear his number three reason. To that, my third point is I don't think people should really be getting their stock ideas from YouTube. Uh, I know, surprise, right? <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love the YouTube platform and it's not to say people can't talk about stocks on YouTube, but the fact of the matter is that YouTube is first and foremost an entertainment platform. Think about the types of videos you see in your recommended feed about given stocks or whatever. It's always like, Tesla to 3000, market's going to crash. <laughs> It's also a lot of stuff that focuses on short-term news. I just don't think YouTube's that appropriate for getting stock positions. So I don't really wanna to contribute to that. I don't wanna be motivated to focus on those types of positions. So Richard believes that YouTube's not the appropriate platform to be getting information about stock picks or company information, security analysis, because there's a lot of entertainment on YouTube and many of the financial content creators lean towards entertainment more than high quality, high quality research and advice. While I do agree that there's some entertainment on YouTube, I would not describe YouTube as an exclusively entertainment platform. There's lots of comedy shows on YouTube, lots of comedy sketches and things of that nature, but YouTube also has a treasure trove of educational content. You can learn about history. You can learn about art and Photoshop and digital media. You can learn about technology skills and IT and programming and all sorts of educational content right on YouTube. And I don't see any reason why you can't also learn information about stocks and companies and in-depth research right on YouTube. In fact, I think it's a very good medium for that educational content. And while Richard brings up the incentive for YouTubers to lean more towards entertainment than education, he doesn't bring up the strong incentive for wealth managers and portfolio managers to not have people freely discussing stock picks and information like that online. That's their business. That's something that people pay them to do is to discuss stock picks and portfolio management directly with their clients. In fact, portfolio managers and wealth managers make a fortune by managing other people's money. On average, they charge a 1.5% assets under management fee every single year that can add up to significant amounts of money over time. There's articles like this from NerdWallet saying that a 1% fee could cost millennials 
$590,000 in retirement savings. That is about what you're paying if you bring your money to a wealth manager or portfolio manager and you let them collect just 1% assets under management for the lifetime of your portfolio. You're gonna be paying something like $590,000 for their management services. So although some YouTubers have incentive to focus on entertainment more than good fundamental analysis, portfolio managers and wealth managers also have significant incentives not to divulge their stock picks or their portfolio management because they charge their clients a lot of money for it. And if they gave away that information for free, they wouldn't be able to charge for it. Now let's go ahead and look at his last reason, number four. And the fourth and final reason, which I think is the most important, is that I don't want to provide stock recommendations uh, and you know, take on that kind of responsibility of, of advising people without knowing them, without knowing their situation, because in many cases, a given stock might not be appropriate for all types of investors. I also agree with Richard here. I think that every portfolio should be tailored around the age and the risk appetite of the investor. If you're young and you have a big risk appetite, you can probably go into a more risky portfolio and try to get bigger earnings. If you're older and you have a bigger portfolio and you're getting closer to retirement, you probably wanna dial things down a little bit and get a little bit more conservative as you're moving closer to retirement. Focus on capital preservation rather than trying to make significant gains. But what I don't see is anybody stating on YouTube that their portfolio is the perfect portfolio for everyone. Nobody's saying that. When I share my portfolio, I'm saying this is what I'm investing in. It's a pretty conservative portfolio. It's tailored around me, my age, and my risk appetite. These are the investments I'm doing and the reasons why. When Jeremy and Kevin share their portfolios, they have wildly bigger risk appetites and therefore they make riskier investments. That's not what I'm doing. So viewers get a wide array of different content and they can see the results of different types of portfolios and they can choose for themselves what type of risk they're willing to take. Hiding viewers of all this information and treating them like children, like they're not even responsible to view other people's portfolios, I think leads to ignorance. When people can't see other investments that other people are making, when that information isn't shared, that breeds ignorance. So when someone like me, Kevin, you know, someone who's a millionaire from a real estate portfolio, shares their investment portfolio, that in no way means it's appropriate for everyone. And I'm not saying that, you know, Meet Kevin is saying that it's appropriate for everyone, that these are all bets. Of course, viewers should understand that Meet Kevin's portfolio being 50% in Tesla is not appropriate for everyone. Meet Kevin is wealthy. He makes a million dollars a month or something like that. Some obscene amount of money and he slaps around stock buys by 100,000 here, 200,000 here, a million dollars here, like it's pennies. He's putting that money in and out of stocks like crazy. Any average viewer will understand that Meet Kevin is in a significantly different place financially than they are. And I have a hard time believing that they're all gonna take on the same amount of risk that Meet Kevin is. This is a very low expectation of viewers. Like they're too delicate. They need to be coddled and they can't be exposed to any information like what a millionaire Meet Kevin is doing with his finances or what Jeremy's doing or Graham Stephan or what I'm doing with my finances. The viewer has to be protected from that information. I don't agree with that at all. I think having this exposure, having this open dialogue between different people making investment decisions and seeing how that plays out is incredibly educational for viewers at large. And I think that over the past couple of years, with the proliferation of financial content on YouTube in particular, people have gained a wealth of knowledge about investing as a result of the transparency of many financial YouTubers, showing transparently what they do with their investments. I think that has a significant positive educational impact on viewers. Another thing on this subject that I'll note is that given the decision between having transparency and seeing what other people are doing with their finances and their investment decisions, what they're buying, what they're selling, how they're changing their portfolio and why, or having opaqueness and not having that be part of the discussion, viewers always overwhelmingly prefer transparency. They always lean towards the side of transparency. A poll I did one year ago on my channel said, do you like hearing more from YouTubers that share their portfolio value or would you rather they not share their personal portfolio value? Yes, I would like to see their portfolio value or no, I would rather not see their portfolio value. 97% said yes out of 2,700 votes. 97% yes, 3% no. That is about as statistically overwhelming as it gets. People overwhelmingly like to see portfolio values and they like to see transparency with investments. And even as recent as three weeks ago, I did another question, another poll on my YouTube community page. This one had 11,000 votes. So 11,000 responses, that's a lot of people. The question was, what do you like most? Commentary on current events, 
or portfolio updates or responding to comments and questions. And again, surprise, surprise, portfolio updates was the most selected option. People like transparency. Viewers like transparency into people's finances. And I do as well. I agree with the viewer here. When I'm looking at different YouTube channels and different content, I think the most interesting content is what people are actually doing with their finances. I like looking at hedge funds and seeing what they're actually invested in. I like looking at Warren Buffett and see what he's actually doing with his buys and sells. And I like looking at YouTubers that have a lot of transparency and seeing what they're doing with their portfolios. I find it more engaging, more educational, and I find it more real than just generic investment advice without any insights into what that person is actually doing with their finances. So while I agree with some of the arguments that Richard brings up and some of the concerns, what he's arguing for overall is less transparency in financial YouTube. For people to be more secret with their investments, more secret with their finances, and to not share openly what they're doing with research on companies, stock picks, portfolio management, or anything in that vein. And I think that's a huge step in the wrong direction. And in fact, I think a lack of transparency in the financial industry in general is what has led to widespread ignorance around finances. People feeling stigmatized, like they can't talk about their portfolio, they can't talk about their investments or how much money they have, that's a no-no. They can't discuss those subjects. Those are off limits for some reason. And the only way you can discuss them is with a professional that's going to charge you a nice fee of 1.5% per year plus consulting fees on top of that. That's the only way you can really openly discuss your finances is with somebody that's making a lot of money from your portfolio. I don't think that's necessary anymore. And overall, I think the level of financial knowledge, financial IQ has increased dramatically over the past couple of years as there's more content creators openly and transparently sharing their finances, their decisions, and their research. So that's my thought on this whole subject. I agree with some of the concerns Richard brought up, but I think overall transparency is a huge net benefit. And I plan on continuing to share my portfolio, my investments, sharing my progress through trying to build wealth. I think it's a fun journey to share. All of us are going through this together. We're all trying to build our portfolios. We all pursue different investments and we see how it turns out. And I think it's more fun to go through that together than wonder what other people are doing and going through it alone. I'd much rather go through that together. Now, moving on from that, I want to respond to this email of a longtime viewer named Key who has turned $235 into $30,000 investing in Dogecoin one year ago. He says, hi, I'm an avid fan. Watch every episode of your show. I like to share my story and get some advice. I was playing around with Dogecoin last year and was lucky and stupid enough to buy up to 100 coins at an average cost of 0 0.00. 216 each. It was just for fun and the total this cost me was $237, an amount I wouldn't mind losing if the price went to zero. Well, that's good, Key. First of all, I see that you only bet $237, a small amount of money. If you lost that, it might sting a little bit, but that's not a catastrophic loss if you lose 200 bucks. You say, at the time, I had around 50,000 in stocks and about $5,000 split between mostly Bitcoin and Ethereum before the pandemic crash. Little did I know that this coin would explode over 12,000% and turn what was originally less than 1% of my portfolio into now over 25%. He says, I want to mention how the influence of emotion can be very powerful and hard to resist while investing. Even now, when looking back in hindsight, I wish I'd put much more money into Dogecoin and I keep having to remind myself that I had more money to spare back then, it would have gone into stocks or the aforementioned cryptocurrencies. Continuing on, he says it is now worth about 30,000, 50,000 at its record peak price, and I have not sold any of it. The thoughts of selling it is very tempting, though I'd like to know what you would do in this situation. Am I just being greedy? Am I delusional in thinking that the price can reach $1 or higher? He says, I figure even if the price plummets 50% or more, I'm still way ahead since I was originally okay with losing my initial investment. I might as well see how far this train will take me. Okay. Also, I'm not in desperate need for the money. Um, right now, I think, I think there, I see some red flags. I see some red flags in what you're saying, but I'm going to continue on reading this email you say the value of everything is equal to what people are willing to pay for it. And with the support of celebrities like Mark Cuban and Elon Musk, who knows? But this kind of thinking could merely be justification to hold on to an asset that is way too volatile to sanely hold. Should I sell it all? Should I sell half? 
and hold the rest, I'm at odds with myself and feel like no matter what I choose to do, there's a good chance I'll regret it. All right, Key, well, I'm going to go ahead and go through some of the things I see as red flags and some of the concerns I have with your situation. But first of all, I want to say congratulations. You turned $237 into $30,000. That is incredible. You should have no regrets and looking back in hindsight, wishing you had invested more. This is a great turnout. This is the kind of turnout that you can only dream of. So don't have any regrets. Don't look in hindsight. You had a great fortune fall upon you. That's like seeing that your home is sitting on top of an ocean of oil or something, right? Most people don't have this type of thing happen. So the first thing I'd say is just be grateful this happened. This is a good thing that happened to your situation. The one thing that I want to highlight and lay out as a concern is that when this happens to people, when they have something this astronomically lucky to some extent happen to them, in a way it can kind of turn you stupid. It can make you make dumb financial decisions in the future by searching to re-replicate this type of unique success over and over again. This was a very lucky thing. Dogecoin exploding was the result of Elon Musk and tweets and popular culture and a lot of events culminating at the very same time and you happen to be before that. It's a unique event. It's unlikely that you're going to see this type of success replicate over and over and over again. Maybe you can get lucky and have it again, but it's just very unlikely. And what I can see is some people in your situation that had this much success with this type of investment, you'll try to replicate it over and over and over again, and you can lose a lot of money doing that if you don't have similar results in the future. So that's what I'd just be aware of. Just check yourself from time to time. Don't be focused on trying to re-replicate your success in Dogecoin over and over again because it's very unlikely and the pursuit of doing that might end up being very costly over time. If you put too much effort into trying to do this and have the same success over and over again, you might end up losing a lot of money in the process. The second thing that's a red flag to me is it seems like you're making a lot of justifications and rationalizations for hanging on to this investment, which I think is extremely risky. You say that you figure even if it plummets 50% or more, I'm still way ahead since I was originally okay with losing my initial investment. That sounds like you're just making peace with losing 50% of 30,000. That's $15,000. You shouldn't want to make peace with losing $15,000. So I wouldn't view this as a unique investment from the rest of your portfolio. The way you should view this is as if you are constructing your portfolio new right now. Would you put 25% of your portfolio, 25% of $115,000 into Dogecoin? Is that how you would allocate your money? And if it's not, you might want to adjust it because the past doesn't really matter. You made money that way. That's exciting. But now you have that money and you want to preserve and protect it. So that portion of your portfolio that initially was almost nothing is now way overweight in your portfolio. So that's the question I would ask yourself is if I was constructing this portfolio new, would I make 25% of it Dogecoin? And you can even look at the examples of the celebrities you listed that you say are in support of Dogecoin, like Mark Cuban and Elon Musk. Does Elon Musk have 25% of his wealth in Dogecoin? Does Mark Cuban have 25% of his wealth in Dogecoin? Does he have 1% of his portfolio in Dogecoin? I don't think so. I don't think that either of them would put anywhere close to 25% of their personal net worth into Dogecoin because I think they'd think that's very irresponsible. And likewise, I don't think 25% of your portfolio should be in Dogecoin. If it was my portfolio and I had some small investment like Dogecoin rock it up and go up to a huge portion of my portfolio, I would definitely sell out at least half of it and reallocate that money into different investments. And I might keep a little bit invested still into Dogecoin. And that way you feel good if it continues to go up because at least you have money still invested in it. But if it goes down, you also feel good because then you have money that you've taken out. You have gains from it. So that's my opinion on it. Unless you have a significant reason to believe that Dogecoin will continue to go further and further and you really want to allocate 25% of your capital to it, I think you should trim that position substantially. That would be what I would do. So that's my advice key. And I know that's probably what you were expecting to hear from me. Um, what I want you to do though is give me updates on this. Email in from time to time, like a month from now, maybe three months from now, and give me an update on what you decided to do ultimately and what the outcome was. And I'll share it with the audience because I think this is a pretty interesting situation you have. So I appreciate you sharing this. Thanks for the email. That's all for today's show. I appreciate you guys for listening and I'll see you guys next time.